Meredith Noble, coach, author, and co-founder of Learn Grant Writing. She's going to walk us through the concept of value-based pricing and how you can use it as a freelance writer to up your game in 2023. Take it away, Meredith. All right. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. We'll see if we can get that to work. Because I, this is a complicated topic, and I know I don't learn very well just audibly. So let's see if this will do the trick. Okay, so I wanted to start with a case study real quick to help kind of illustrate the difference between hourly pricing and value-based pricing. So early in my freelance career in the first year, I was asked to write two Indian community development block grants. Their federal grants are complicated. And I had some efficiencies to producing these. Like I could produce two at one time because I had done the grant before. So I already had a sample narrative and I, I knew the client well. They were already a client that paid me to do past projects. So I would, I have a choice, right? Do I charge hourly based on how many hours it will actually take me to get those two proposals in on relatively short notice, or do I use value-based pricing? So if I were to charge hourly and I didn't have too much time before the deadline was hitting, this was right over the holiday break, it was like right now. So if I, my rate at the time was $100 per hour, so times the 120 hours I estimated it would take me to do both of those proposals, and I would have billed $12,000 if I was charging hourly. But instead, I charge value-based pricing. So I know the, you know, the t at the time, what I you know, perceived that value to be was $7,500 per application. So you multiply that by two applications and it's 15,000 that I actually billed. So that difference is three grand just between hourly and value-based pricing. And when you multiply that across a whole year of projects, like this is a substantial amount of money especially considering that now I would charge at least $12,000 for that same grant application. So that would have been based on value-based pricing. I would have billed $24,000 for it, even though it would have taken me, you know, $12,000 if billing hourly. So double the price would have been my earnings um, based on using value-based pricing. So just to give a little bit of background context, my zone of genius is grant writing, probably figured that out, but I, how it started, I suppose, was I started consulting by myself because I'd launched a completely different startup. It failed epically. Freelancing is the best business to start in the world, especially writing, because all you need is a computer and someone willing to pay you and you're in business. And as that grew, especially when COVID hit and I was inundated with people trying to go after CARES Act money. That was when I ended up hiring a bunch of my students that were in my original grant writing course, bringing on Alex pictured here. She was just this local project manager in my small town. And we like really fine tuned the project management behind assembling teams quickly and disassembling on projects. And the reason we built a very profitable business was because we always centered our pricing around value, value based pricing, not almost never was it just hourly. So this is a quick graphic of kind of teaches like how I think about this process, which we're not going to go through right now, but essentially like how do you generate ID, generate opportunities for yourself in a very cyclical, repeatable pattern. And then if you're just getting started anyway, it's like, okay, once you've made your first 15K freelancing, now how do we scale that to a $250,000 a year business and beyond if you want, right? So that's, and some people end up wanting to land a new job. So that's sort of like the method that I now teach that came from that experience. So what I wanna back up to is what is value-based pricing? Are you just picking a number out of thin air? No. So value-based pricing is the sum of hours required to do the project, so you're actually calculating it. How many hours is it going to take for me to do this? Your specialized expertise, how does that factor in? What is it worth to your client to have this project be done? And the time to delivering it. Are they asking it to be done on a super short notice? Well, then you pay a higher price to have that, you know, for you to have to cram, right? So um, those all factor into when you think about what your pricing is. So I had I have one more example. I guess I'm going to, let me just pop something up real quick. So this is 
This is the profit building fee calculator that I always start with when I'm working on a project. This is something we give away in our course and I'd be totally down to share it. Let's see if it'll let me zoom in. Essentially, hmm, it's being a little slow. Essentially, we still have to always start with thinking about it hourly. Like what is every project going to take to do? Like line by line, really, especially when we're talking grants, there's a lot of moving parts. So I'm gonna zoom in and let me know if you can see this, Sydney, if it's zoomed in enough. Yes, I can see that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm still thinking through all of the tasks required to deliver a project. That's kind of not a good example. I'll go to the second one. Estimating the number of hours, multiplying that by the rate of whoever's working on it. And if you're working by yourself, you can still always find someone else that can be supporting you. Even when you're small, teams are really important. Just quality check above all else. Uh, and then that gives me my labor costs. I can factor in any like, you know, am I paying a subcontractor to do something to like finish the design of this proposal, whatever. And then I have like my minimum cost to charge. Like if I were charging hourly and giving an estimate, like this would be the fee. But this does not factor in all those other things that we talked about, which are extremely valuable, especially because the faster you get, you're literally punishing yourself. Like I got so good at those ICDBG grants because I did them every single year that I was faster at them, I had templates for it. So I would just be getting paid less and less and less, even though I was more valuable because I had done so many that were successful. So you can see how hour, charging hourly literally punishes you the better that you get. Okay, so here's the second example I wanted to give. Um, on the right is a picture of my team, uh, at least part of the team, not everybody, but a good good portion. Okay, so, all right, so I charged $18,000 for a federal grant that was pursuing a $350,000 grant, like that was the amount. I saved that client $70,000 because I knew of a very small little rule that I could apply to get them out of the 20% match requirement. So not only did they not have to pay me 18K to write the grant and 70K coming up with that for match, they only had to pay me to write the grant and they got 100% of it in grant funding. So here's the thing though that happened with that project because value-based pricing works well when you understand the scope of what you're doing. Like it's, uh, you know, you've got your hands around it and you understand really, really clearly the value delivered. So originally I charged, it was something like 12K for that grant originally. But what ended up happening was the funder came back to us and had a lot of kind of unforeseen work that they wanted things updated, et cetera. And it was really outside of the regular scope of what I possibly could have imagined. So I got with the client and said, okay, I'm gonna add to our contract a $10,000 lump sum that you, are, you have approved and I will bill against it hourly as it's needed. I don't know what we're gonna get sucked into here with this funder. It might be only three hours of work, it might be 30, but that they've already approved an amount. So I don't have to keep going back asking for more and more money because that's tacky. They've already approved amount, but I'm de-risking it for both of us because I don't know how long it's gonna take. They don't either. Um, so if it's less, they, you know, they're not having to pay me a, you know, a ton because it wasn't you know, unreasonable, right? So I had contracted with that 10K to bill them up to $22,000, but I actually only billed 18 because we were able to get the project done. So I hope, does that make sense? Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. So, okay. Well, I think, does that answer kind of like the basics before you want me to jump into the questions that were submitted? Yeah, I think that's the main thing people were confused about in our community was how do I go, for, how do I figure out what to charge them? What's my starting point? For sure, for sure. Yeah, that's so great. And I think this is like, this is why I've really enjoyed putting together the content for this because it got me thinking about it in even a different way I'm going to bring back to my own community. So like I said, I mean, go back to the drawing board on, I mean, just even this example. So A, start with the calculator. You have to know your hourly, like what is it going to cost and do and, and add more time than you think it will because things, you know, your client never gets things back as quickly as you'd like, right? So like you have to be, don't be super duper fast. Like give yourself a nice 
estimate of time it's going to take hourly. Then we layer in those other factors. So for instance, uh, with this specific federal grant, I had done one of these examples or these grants before successfully. So I already had some expertise that was valuable to the client. The specific scope of the project had a lot to do with redeveloping this old airport site. And I used to work at an engineering firm and I understand environmental site assessment work and how to, um, like I, I understood the technical scope and was able to help them in developing the scope of their project because of that background experience. That's worth something, right? Um, I charged $35,000 is the most I've ever been paid for a single grant. And it was the, the grant amount was 20 million to do this big port infrastructure project. So, and so frankly, they made a killer deal. My mentor said I should be charging 75K and he was right. It's what I should have been charging. I shouldn't have the confidence for it. So, you know, part of it is factoring in like, what are they getting out of this? What is the value for them? from your work and that value of your expertise that allows you to have a better deliverable. So those things are a little hard to calculate and factor in, um, but that's why I think it helps to join a community like this, like the Writer Society, is that you can get your base number, your hourly rate, and then you bring it to someone that has an understanding of value-based pricing and they can help you like make the leap when you might be feeling a little bit like, how do I value this? Um, honestly, going through, going through this exercise has made me realize I'm way undercharging and I've known this for a while. Our, our product, we have, we have the global grant writing collective. It's for people that are launching their career in grant writing. And, uh, we charge 3000 a year and I'm like, this is like ridiculous for how much they get out of it. Like it's a $10,000 program easy. Uh, so it's, it's just interesting because, you know, I wasn't even doing that full exercise of really thinking about what do you bring to the, to the table? So anyway, let's hit the questions and hopefully that'll help kind of unpack this a little further. Yes. Um, okay. So how do I figure out how much value I'm generating for a client when the content has no direct payoff? For example, a blog article. Here's the thing. Your client is not paying you if there isn't a payoff. They're not having you do it just because it's for fun. Like our core business strategy for marketing is SEO. So I pay, I have a content director that writes and she started just writing blogs for me before I brought her on. And if you look at this screenshot, this is from Uber Suggest, which is pretty cheap. Um, you can go in there and even use it for the tool for free to search how websites are performing. And if you look at the top five performing pages on my website, three of them are blog posts. So three of them bring me literally like, what, 3,500 lead or new visitors a month. And that a percentage of those become new leads, then a percentage of those become new customers. So there, there is literally a, a numeric value to that blog article. So what you could do is ask your client, what is your conversion of leads to customers? And they'll tell you it's like 5%, 10%, whatever their percent is, depending on the product. And you can actually back, and you know what the price point is that they charge. You can literally back into the value of that. So if we were to do this math real quick, um, let's say the top review of top 20 online grant writing courses. I'm going to pull up a calculator real quick. So 2,248, um, so about like 35% will give us their email when they land on our page. That's 786 people and 5% become paying customers. So that's 39 people times $3,000 is 118,000. So this blog post is worth $118,000 to me. Like you have value in the work you're doing. And if you don't, then A, you have an offer problem and that's going to be affecting the fact like how people want to do business with you or you don't understand your customer's pains well enough to be communicating that value. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think one of the other questions they had in this area was if I don't know, like if they don't post, you have a subscription website, right? Oh uh, yeah. So it's easy enough to find that information. If they don't have like a direct um, information on their site that exposes what a lead might be worth for them. Is it okay to ask the client what a yes, lead is worth? Yes, that's 100% strategic. Okay. Do it in your onboarding. Do it in customer discovery. 
Like do it in that pro before they're even a customer because you need this information to put to position yourself for value based pricing. So okay, develop those questions in your customer. I I, I could just totally nerd out on this because we I have literally a questionnaire yeah. that we go through when you're learning about the customer and really drawing out and understanding where are they struggling so you can make sure your solution helps solve that. So yes, fair game to ask. Um, it'll be differentiating. It'll make you really stand out. So is there a way I can create a pricing formula and apply it to my work? Yes. So one of the things, the easiest things you can do is create a foot in the door deliverable. That is a fixed fee. So for us, we teach how to produce a funding strategy. A funding strategy is when you research grants and make a recommendation of what to pursue for the next 12 to 18 months. Literally works wonders. Like everyone needs to know what grants to pursue before you actually start pursuing them because you can't price your services till you know what you're going after. So that starting deliverable, like even if you're brand new, you can be charging two or three K for a funding strategy, right? Because it's research, it's critical thinking. You have that skill. So just set that rate, just set it and forget it. And that is your formula for your foot in the door product. Then what I recommend is off, it depends on your work, like how much you can kind of create a formula exactly, but you can start thinking about what are ranges for different scopes of work. So for example, here are our updated fees that we recommend kind of benchmarking against in the grant writing world. So we have our affordable and fair pricing, like you're kind of new to it or you're, you're um, kind of intermediate stage. If you're charging premium pricing, you're on the right side, um, which comes from more experience. So you can see, I kind of have these ranges of what's a straightforward letter of inquiry worth versus a federal grant. What's that worth? And so you can give these, you can kind of have these ranges that, that help you, A, you're still doing your calculating the hours because you gotta make sure you're not like undercharging, but then you can compare that against your ranges for that service. So hope that helps. And then the next question was, is value-based pricing unpredictable for the client? No, hourly pricing, I would argue, is more unpredictable. So I have a friend that I grew up with in Wyoming and he's a, um, I don't want to say a mutter. What does he do? He does um, tile work. And so he's working on these multi-million dollar houses in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and he's charging, you know, $85 an hour. And that's what he quotes as his fee. That is horrible for the client because they're like, uh, is it going to take you 10 hours? Is it going to take you a hundred hours? Like I can't conceptualize what that is going to cost me. Right? So and then he just starts making himself a commodity because now someone's just going to shop around like, well, can I find someone who will do it for 75 an hour? Even right. Cause then they just start thinking about the price per hour, not thinking about like the bigger picture, what's it actually going to cost. So it is way more um, helpful for your client to give them a fixed fee so that they can plan around that. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One, you can do a monthly retainer if you're doing like truly monthly retainer type work, like you do a newsletter or social media management, like it really is the same every month. A monthly retainer is appropriate. My other favorite method, if your work is a little bit more cyclical, is contracting one large lump sum per year. So let's say like you have got a $20,000 contract with the client but you bill against that $20,000 on a project by project basis. So let's say you've got a $20,000 content writing contract with us, Learn Grant Writing. Every time we would be assigning you a substantial new project, you would write me an email and say, okay, for me to complete this project, it's going to cost um, $4,000 uh, billed by percentage of work complete. So you're just billing it as you're getting the work done monthly. Um, do you approve? I respond back, say, yes, approved. You now have, you know, that's our contract. Because I've actually already contracted with you with like the big amount. And now you're just approving basically task amendments. So that's um, so much better for your client versus this like 
unknown, like, are they going to work fast? Do they work slow? Like, what am I actually going to be paying? Okay, so let's see. Then, will I need to write a proposal for every project I take on with a client? Or will we end up with a reusable rate, like if they always want similar length content? Okay. So the answer is definitely no, you do not need to write a proposal for every project. Think about your customer and their like their needs. They're busy. I worked with a graphic designer when I, let's see, I'll grab it. Um, I wrote, I updated my book a year and a half ago. And so she did the graphics and there's some graphics inside here and she did. It was great, but we did add, a, you know, so we contracted for the scope of this full project. And then there were some additional things we added onto. And she, you know, the amount she was charging me was like a couple hundred bucks for these small projects. And it was super annoying to have to go through this whole proposal process and send back a signed PDF for a really small amount. Like I was getting annoyed by it. I was like, girl, I'm, like I'm already paying you. I'm proving I pay you. Like just bill me for the work. I don't care what it costs. So, I mean, I did care, but I knew that she wasn't going to be unreasonable because I've already seen her work. So I just want you to always think about like, am I making this process really nice for my client? And preferably you're only contracting once a year because um, you're making them make a purchase decision once a year versus fatiguing your client out on like making 20 purchase decisions through the year. So instead I recommend going bigger, doing some sample project, your foot in the door project that like proves your worth, proves you're amazing, then amend your contract for, okay, let's just set up a lump sum for the year and we will bill against that hourly on a project by project basis or not hourly. You'll bill against that on a project by project basis. Um, and so this kind of blends some of what I've already talked about. Plus you can create some kind of formulas for similar length content. And that could be a way for you to simplify what they can expect. Um, all right. So how do I explain my pricing when clients try to make sense of it based on word count or time? I quote $400 for a thousand word article and they say 40 cents per word. Okay. I have two thoughts about this one. It could be that you have a client problem in terms of like, I always think about the five-year test and the unicorn client test. These are two tests that we teach. So the five-year test is, could I see myself working with this client for five years? And the answer is usually no. Like usually you're kind of just seeing it as like, well, it's, it's a project, it'll pay, but like they, there's some red flag, yellow flags, maybe a red flag and, but whatever, like I'll just, do the work and be done. Well, then all of a sudden you're expending yourself, you're pouring out your energy on lousy clients. We want unicorn clients. We want ones that like you love working with them and you don't have to like, you can build a relationship year after year after year because you deliver so much value to them because then also your value becomes even more to them. You can start charging more and more because for them to have to start new with someone that doesn't know your brand voice that doesn't know um, your product as well as you will, all of that, like you become even more valuable. That's why I took my blog writer who was charging me like this, the $400 for a blog and turned her into an employee because I was like, she's too valuable at this point. Like she has so proven her worth to me that like, I don't want to lose her. It would be so rough to go find somebody else. <laughs> so there's that. So you make sure you don't have just a lousy client that's being a cheapskate because those you'll never win with those people. They just suck. Second, it is your responsibility to reposition your brand beyond the industry standard. So I know that there's a lot of language around in this space, you know, X cents per word. The same thing exists in grant writing where it's, it's, it's a lot of emphasis. Like everyone bills hourly. Everybody does. And so for us to, you know, train up literally this little army of grant writers to communicate with clients. I will not be billing hourly. I charge on value-based pricing. And this is why this is to your benefit. Um, that, that responsibility is on you. And I don't want that to be like a heavy thing because it's actually extremely freeing. 
you can reposition yourself as like the premium provider. You deliver an amazing experience and service. Like you get paid more, you work less. Secondly, this is why we, I'm going to presume it, it. What's your like makeup of your community between um, men and women? Is it 50, 50 or is it tend to be like skewed one, towards like one gender or the other? It's mostly women. Okay. I would have guessed that. So yeah. All right, ladies. So here's the deal. We also have mostly women in the collective too. And we are not doing ourselves a favor with the gender pay gap that we're experiencing when we ourselves continue to perpetuate the freaking problem by not charging enough for what we do. Right. So it's really important if you can't motivate yourself to charge more for you and your own freaking bank account, do it for your daughters, do it for the women that are in your life because we are raising the standard where like all boats rise if we figure out how to charge appropriately. The other thing is we are experiencing a massive shift to freelancing in a way that's never been seen before. Over 50, per, you probably have the stats better than I do, but like over 50% of the workforce in the US will be freelancing by, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting, like soon, a <laughs> couple of years. And most people aren't charging enough because when they think about hourly, you're comparing yourself to what you were paid hourly in a job. But there you had 40 hours a week already paid for. You had benefits. You might have, right? There's there's all these other things that you have. You didn't have to pay taxes, right? Your The company paid profit taxes. You didn't have to pay for an office. The office was provided for you. So we think about just the hourly rate I was paid as an employee or your salary. And you don't think about like, what are the true costs of running a business and building a business that's sustainable and vibrant? And so we, that's why we have to get off this whole hourly thing, because also your client is going to compare their hourly wage to what you're charging and have heartburn against that um, versus if they just see like, oh, I'm paying this lump sum. I understand the value I'm getting for this work. Like it just doesn't have as much um, like mind trickery going on because they it's a different way to understand the value being delivered versus getting stuck in doing this like hourly comparison math. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm super fired up about this topic. So the example I can give <laughs> is this gal, Jess, um, actually just made a case study about her last night. So Jess approached, so she did this method I was just talking about back here. She did an informational interview with a prospective client. They wanted a funding strategy, she thought. So she gave them a proposal and they said, there's no way we can afford that. That's way too much. So she went back to them and said, okay, but this is what you told me your pain points are. So like really she ended up going back and listening and understanding. They really just wanted to know that they were paying for grants to also get done. And usually I recommend like you need to figure out what you're going after before you scope for grant writing, but that's what they wanted. So she ended up restructuring her offer. So instead of quoting 2K for a funding strategy, her contract she presented to them then was 6,000. So they said they couldn't afford her at two grand, but then she gave them a six grand offer as a counter offer because that was getting at the root of what they wanted, the funding strategy plus the promise of like two or three proposals small grants. And then they said, yes, this is the same. And then she had a different client that said, we've never paid our grant writers more than $20 an hour. And she's now getting paid by that same client, 120 an hour. So she has completely shifted their perspective on the value you get based on understanding their pain points, delivering a great service and stick into your guns being willing to walk um, and find a client that values what you're doing. Does that make example? Resonate? That's a fantastic example. Yeah. Yeah. I, she's got a, um, I wonder if I could literally just made this. Uh, I could share, I could share. She has, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel and search Jess Stack, she's, um, we've got two interviews with her and her stories are amazing. Um, okay. Where are we at? I think we're getting to this question. So how do I transition my existing clients who are paying per word 
or hourly to my new pricing structure. So I run into this problem all the time because a lot of people start freelancing before they find us in the collective and then they and then they're like, oh crap, what do I do with these like lousy, way underpaying, not necessarily lousy. What do I do with these underpaying clients? So a couple of things. It's the new year, baby. So your timing is freaking awesome. You have an excuse right now because it is the new year to say, hey, my rates get updated annually. We um, are hitting the new year. So here is my updated pricing structure that I will be billing you against uh, moving forward. So just leverage the fact that literally January is around the corner. This is an amazing time to update your hourly structure. When I used to work for that engineering consulting firm, we literally had a rate, a rate sheet per kind of person. Like, is it a, and you know, an engineer, a advanced engineer, a project manager, whatever. And then their hourly rate. And that was always updated every year. And it would increase by a certain percentage, right? Um, because we haven't even talked about the freaking fact that we've experienced 15% inflation in the last two years. And so if you're not asking for this pay increase, you are actually agreeing to take a substantial pay cut. So let that soak in. Uh, okay, so the other thing is every time you're contracting moving forward, make sure you're setting that expectation in your contract that rates are updated annually. So you just set that expectation and that's how it's done. And it can be either be done annually at the new year or it could be annually when you're renewing your contract with them. Uh, another thing you can do is leverage scarcity. So bring back to this existing client, say, hey, for me to give you the best service possible where I have high energy and can just crush it for you, um, I am limiting 2023 to serving X number of clients. So here is our new rate structure. Um, make that value proposition really clear. Like I've already been working with you. You don't have to find someone else to get up to speed which would, you know, just finding someone else is a huge headache, blah, 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 like put in your value prop points and then your call to action. So like if you, uh, you know, if you agree to this, um, you know, please basically sign and return the like the second page of your contract um, approving the new rates and then you just move forward from there. So I wonder if I could just pull up the contract template real quick. Would that be helpful? Let's see. Okay. Um, one thing I would recommend is checking out the legal page. So she has all of these amazing legal contracts that you can buy the templates for. And it was put together by like a legit, le um, this is for the product contract templates. Anyway, you could go through here and find good contracts that are up pertinent to the work you're delivering, maybe virtual assistants, or if you hire independent contractors, like these are really, really legit. So I would recommend checking out pages contracts. Um, but here's what we provide. So we have, you know, sample scope, here's the background, scope of work, blah, 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 team, introduce your team. It's good to even start teaming up. That's the whole point of the writer society is work together. Then I often contract is my favorite way. Our fee is X number of dollars billed monthly by percent of work complete. I know this is a little bit of a challenge for the writers because you guys are doing some probably smaller, faster projects, but I would still try to get under contract to be just producing monthly content for them and just already being under contract for that. Um, the deliverable, the schedules here, whatever, whatever. And then this is what I was wanting to bring attention to. So you know, your name here, client signature, client name, client address. So ask for them to sign and return this updated contract reflecting your new rates. Like that could be what is like the final call to action in your, maybe it's a letter to your clients stating like, hey, rates are going up. Um, and these are, the, this, these are like the value props for why um, this is still like completely reasonable for you, blah, blah, blah. And then your call to action. So that would be how I would handle making that, you know, personalized touch to each of your clients. Um, yeah. So if you want to learn more, we actually do have a training on mistakes to avoid in finding clients and pricing. Okay. And then I do have a book where I don't really talk about, it's really, I just talk about grant writing that I don't think that's necessarily your jam, but it's, um, there's a lot of good stuff. We are talking about how Oops. do you create recession proof? Uh, We'll get out of that. 
but anyway, those both of those resources could be helpful. Um, but yeah, thank you for for inviting me to come. I'm happy to answer whatever other questions you might have. But I think this is a really important topic, especially with the new year. Um, and I'm yeah enjoyed being able to kind of think about this critically for your audience and put some slides together. Yeah, thank you so much for, for showing us all that because I know when I was first starting out with freelancing. When I was first introduced to value-based pricing, there were like just tons of questions that came through. Like, do I still factor in my time? What do I base the value on? How many questions is it reasonable to ask the client to calculate that value? So right. you were extremely helpful in that. Right on. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks. Happy to support your audience however I can. Big fan of writers, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, and I will link um, to all your resources. We do have some people in the community who have expressed interest in grant writing, so I think they'll find that extremely oh, cool. helpful. We also have a lot of article writers and copywriters, but I think this can be applied to any kind of writer if you work around yeah. it. Like you said, you can kind of come up with a formula based on what content you're creating. So, 100%. Even if you don't want to touch grants at all, <laughs> what we cover is how you find clients. doesn't matter what industry you're in. And then even, frankly, just what we talk about in terms of business setup and systems also transcends any industry. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Everyone needs a good system. Yeah. And the part on raising your rates, because definitely this is the time to do it with inflation. It's this there's no the excuse. To do it. <laughs> it can't be yeah. avoided this year. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming, Meredith. I appreciate you taking the time to talk. My pleasure, Sydney. Thank you for forming the amazing group that you have. And everyone, thank you so much for your time. You know where to find me if you uh, want to drop a line.